Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for this installment of the Climate Speaker Policy st Series. Uh, my name is Ethan McMahon, and I just finished up a detail at NASA, and I'm returning to my home organization of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, thanks to the Applied Sciences Program for, for hosting me during that time. And special thanks to Kathy Carroll for her help in coordinating this event. The Earth Science Division started this series a few years ago to help the headquarters staff understand how people who are outside of the Earth Science community think and talk about climate. So we've had speakers from a range of fields such as national security, insurance, and public health, and we'll organize these talks on a monthly basis. Hopefully these different perspectives will broaden our horizons about how people are adapting to and planning for climates and changes in climate. The format for today's talk is a 30-minute presentation by our speaker, then 25 minutes or so of questions and answers. Today's speaker is Margaret Henry, the Director of Sustainability and Corporate Social Responsibility Performance at Sodexo, one of the leading global food and facilities companies. Margaret works with multiple parties about sustainability in the food system, and she manages the performance monitoring of sustainability at Sodexo. She has worked on several projects related to global food issues, and she is a trustee of the Farm and Wilderness Foundation. Margaret will speak about recent successes and the horizon of public-private partnerships with regard to environmental sustainability. She will describe how she coordinates with government agencies, the private sector, and non-governmental organizations to balance issues related to the food system. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Henry. Thank you all for having me. It's great to be here today. Um, it's not every day that we get to come down and talk to a group of scientists like yourselves. So it's a great opportunity and I really look forward to the questions. Uh, feel free to store them up. First, I'm just going to tell you very briefly, I promise, about Sodexo, who we are, what we do, so you understand where some of my comments are coming from. Um, we are a leader in quality of life services. It's really very hard to peg us down as food service or facilities management or elder care or in-home care. There's so many different things that we do as a company. Essentially, we go into anyone's um, area. If it's NASA, we may come in and we would do everything that's not your core science business. We would ensure that everything functions properly, the building, the food system, the security, et cetera. Um, so we actually do that all around the world. We are the 19th largest supply, um, employer in the world. Um, so employees is a huge focus. Um, we're in 80 different countries, 33,000 different locations. We serve 1% of the country's population every single day, 75 million different customers. Uh, so we touch a huge cross-section of the world. It's absolutely fascinating to work with our customers and our clients because they run the political gamut. They run ev the age gamut. We are very likely serving food or serving the building or doing some sort of service for your children in their elementary school, their high school, their college. We do many, many different corporate, government, etc. cafeterias. We do many building services senior centers, hospitals. These are our biggest areas of business. Um, so we, we touch people throughout their lives and we touch many, many different people, which for me is extremely fun and it's wonderful because I never stay in one niche. I'm always challenged to break outside of however I'm thinking because I'm always speaking to different kinds of people with different opinions. Um, we have been recognized uh, across the world in a variety of areas that touch on our sustainability, wellness, and diversity journey. Our four priorities that we focus on in this area, we call it our Better Tomorrow Plan, and it encompasses our work in nutrition, health and wellness, protecting the environment, committing to local communities, and developing our people and promoting diversity. There's many, many cross-sections between these four, so it's sometimes hard to put them in different boxes, but they're the, the basic pillars of our Better Tomorrow plan. Now, how does that touch on climate change? Well, Sodexo direct, this is, of course, you're probably all extremely familiar with this from the IPCC report, the contributions to climate change. Um, when Sodexo looks at this, we see direct impact from our business in the forestry realm, which is so much about land use change, agriculture for our food purchases, 
industry where we are very often managing those buildings and making or helping to make some of those choices that directly impact the climate. Um, we also do touch on transport, energy supply, waste and wastewater treatment, but we look at these areas that are brighter and say those are directly in Sodexo's sphere of influence. Now, how many of you are familiar with the greenhouse gas protocol, scope one, two, and three accounting, any of that? Okay, good to get a sense of the audience and where you are. Um, so when companies are asked to do anything on climate, the first thing they're usually asked is to report to the carbon disclosure project, the CDP. And increasingly more and more companies are doing this. Um, and it's really the tip of the iceberg in terms of any company understanding its impact where do the different ways that anyone interacts with the climate touch on a company. So they've divided any sort of climate reporting into scope one, which is really primarily direct production of greenhouse gases, which Sodexo has virtually none of. We have no real owned energy plants, um, no owned fleet. Um, Scope two is then the purchased electricity, steam, heating, cooling, um, for example, everything in this building, all of your utilities would be your scope two. Um, for us, we have very little scope two as well because almost all of our operations, we are invited guests in someone else's buildings. Um, we may manage them, we may provide services in those buildings, but we're not the owners and we're not the leasers either. So our scope too is extremely, extremely small. It's you know, a couple of corporate offices here and there. Um, and most companies, when they're reporting, when they set targets, anything that they're being held accountable for, getting awards for, anything that's being thought about in the current legislation in terms of regulation is almost always your scope one and two. Um, but Sodexo, when we're looking at it, we're looking at our scope three because it's 99% of our impact and we recognize that and we have such a direct impact on our clients scope one and two, which is what our clients are setting goals on. So our goal is really to be a partner and is to help our clients and our customers make a difference. Um, but when you guys are thinking about this and you're hearing other talks in this climate series, you might be thinking, well, is this their direct impact? How far out are they going in terms of their sphere of influence? So for us, our scope three is, if it's our building management, then what are we implementing in terms of equipment or cleaning practices or material use? Where are those coming from? How are we, what are we recommending and what is that impact? In the food area, which is what I was asked to focus on primarily today, that's agriculture, growing all the food that we serve. Um, and just like for many of you, you eat a lot of food, but that's not your, some, sometimes the first thing you think about when you think about your impact on the climate. But it's a huge impact. So for us, how we source and where we source from is a big part of our climate impact. And that's scope three. No one's holding us accountable for that today. That's, that's additional. We've chosen to focus on that because we know it's a tremendous amount of our impact. When you break down where our impact comes in um, for climate and for carbon, um, our food purchases are probably about 60% of our impact. And then our building management and some of our other services make up the rest of that. So, talking about food, um, where does most of the climate impact come from in the food sector, in the production of food? Um, this is from Greenpeace, and I'll talk to the public-private collaboration, but they have some great graphics around this um, that make it really easy to say, when you're thinking about agriculture, where do you start to think about? This is really, where does the impact come from? But then you also have to cross-reference that with where are you going to have opportunities to make change? Um, so certainly so much of it comes from animals, from methane, from cattle specifically, um, from manure, from fertilization, both the production and the use on fields, biomass burning, rice production, machinery, irrigation. You notice that the transportation of food does not show up as being significant enough to be part of this. I'll touch on that soon. But if you're thinking about when you go to a grocery store, what do you see as sustainable? What do you see as perhaps good for the climate? Transportation doesn't, doesn't show up on here. But 
first I'm going to talk to you basically what's going to happen with agriculture over the next 40 years. How is it going to change? What are some of those impacts? What are we looking at when we're looking into our future and how to sustain our business, how to sustain the ability to continue to purchase food, have food available, provide good food to folks. Um, over the next decade or so, we're already seeing this. It's affecting crop yields. There's major, major crops that we rely on for so much of our food production that are experiencing decreases in yields that are directly a result of climactic impacts. We're seeing that upset prices around the world. And not part of this, but I would say also, when you're thinking about some of the global conflicts, there's often some sort of food component. Uh, food scarcity, food availability, Sometimes it's around the actual agriculture and the subsidies, et cetera. But food is increasingly being disrupted, the food system. Um, tropical regions are impacted the most, which means the poorest are disproportionately affected. Both the poorest farmers, which are often the smallholders, who don't have quite as much of a buffer, and the poorest who are those trying to afford food. Um, adaptation we're not seeing happen fast enough. If we're going to make some significant changes in both the contributions and the adaptation, um, we, need, we need faster pace. 2030s, what's going to happen? Most likely, crop and pasture yields will significantly decline, particularly Northeast Brazil, Central America, East Africa, New Zealand. Um, there will be changes in other places, but these are the places where it's going to decline most rapidly and most significantly. Um, and today's food system is extremely interconnected. Anything that happens in Northeast Brazil means likely your pork prices will shoot up if you're buying pork from China, which happens to be fed soy from Brazil. Um, there, this doesn't mean that those in Northeast Brazil will suffer. This means that it affects the entire global, global food system. Um, small scale producers, again, will continue to be disproportionately impacted. Um, on both sides, both the production and the ability to purchase food. Often smallholders do purchase a significant amount of their food. Um, adaptation assistance will need to take some sort of form. Um, unclear what that might be. Um, some of those areas might be crops. In the temperate regions, can you switch to varieties that are more adapted to the climate? Can you optimize irrigation? Should you grow things that are water intensive in regions that don't have a lot of water? Is lettuce in California going to continue? Um, how do you manage soil nutrients and erosion? You saw that fertilizing, um, both the production of fertilizer and the use on the fields was a huge amount of our climate impact. How can you optimize that? How can you reduce that impact while continuing to increase yields, which requires the proper nutrients in the soil? For livestock, um, Livestock, both in what you saw in terms of the actual emissions from cattle, but also in terms of soil erosion and soil degradation, is a huge amount of our climate impact. But there are regions of the world where having livestock improves the land, and there are a lot of degraded lands that desperately need to be brought back on board. Sometimes cattle can be part of that equation, but it's not so simple. It's sometimes. It's certain regions. It's with certain characteristics. Um, it's one of the things that makes agriculture so very difficult from one hillside to the next, you might have different conditions and you might need different intervention patterns, um, which is part of the second thing that will happen a lot with livestock is probably um, a lot more intercropping. You will have farms that do have livestock, various different kinds, probably less of one, and trying to mix that with crops, trying to have the right balance to change all those nutrients that are in the soil and provide the right things for the animals. Controlling the spread of pests, weeds, and diseases is going to be a huge factor, particularly as the GMO debate continues. But as you try to increase the efficiency of agriculture, you will have more and more pests, more weeds, more diseases. And how do you combat that in a way that's acceptable for the planet, acceptable for human health, and perhaps helpful for the soil, actually builds up soil quality? It's, it's a huge difficulty. There are no easy answers in this area. Fisheries, which a very significant proportion of the world's protein comes from fisheries, and climactically, a lot more should. Um, 
So what's going to happen? Can we switch to more abundant species? Can we start using some of those underutilized species in our recipes that today you don't, you don't use a lot, but perhaps are actually not endangered? Um, can you restore some of those degraded habitats? Uh, can you strengthen infrastructure? 80% uh, of the world's fish comes from 20% of the world's fisher people. Um, so 80% of the fisher people are not catching a whole lot of fish, but depending on it for their livelihood, and usually with very poor infrastructure. By 2050s, what's going to happen? Widespread impacts, widespread famine, widespread food and farming changes will happen. It's, it's hard to predict that far into the future, as you all know very well, I'm sure. Um, but some of it's good news, some of it's bad news. Fisheries in, the, in uh, high latitudes will probably see a huge increase because warmer waters and more fish and more nutrients, um, certain species will become significantly more abundant. Um, but there aren't a lot of people there. So this is going to have a huge impact on people. Um, the places in Orange where the people currently are, where all those fisher folk are, are going to have a lot fewer fish. Um, so beyond just being able to buy food, the actual production of food is going to become very difficult for folks. So, so what happens? Um, what, what are some of the innovations? Um, and I would say we can't wait till 2050 for these. I mean, this is what we need to start doing today. Um, and some of these are the areas where Sodexo is starting to focus. Different diets. Since we touch so many of the people on this planet, can we help to shift diets? Um, there's been pretty good success, I would say, over the last decade of stealth salt reduction, I would say. Suppliers stealthily redu reducing the amount of salt in food, but not telling anyone, because then people might not eat their potato chips. Um, but that's actually shifted diet patterns significantly. Can we do that in a way that benefits the client, the, the climate also? Can you use the lessons learned there and apply them to reducing meat consumption? It's a little more overt, so it may take some other strategies. But we've played with healthy Mondays, meatless Mondays, plant-based diets. Uh, I think this is going to be certainly part of the answer. Um, shifting production areas. Sodexo is not particularly involved in this because we sit so far from the farmer. Um, but it's certainly happening. New approaches to managing waste, water, and energy. This is exactly in our wheelhouse. We are focusing on waste tremendously. There's so much food waste right now, um, and food service can be a big part of reducing that. Um, so we're doing a variety of innovative programs in, that are both within our own sphere of influence and influencing our customers, because waste comes in two primary areas in, in the food service area. One is the back of the house, where we're cooking and what we're throwing away and how we're dealing with leftovers, and the other is just people not eating everything they take on their plates. Um, and things in the back of the house you can do some innovative things with, you can donate to food shelters, etc. Things from customers' plates, compost or landfill are pretty much two of, two of the biggest options. Is there an option to, say, send it to some of the dairy farms that are increasingly doing something where they aggregate their manure in a methane digester? So they reduce the manure impact on the climate and they need food scraps in order to do that digestion properly. So can we help add some of those food scraps to those methane biodigesters to optimize the methane production um, and the energy production. Things like that are directly in our wheelhouse. Um, so that's what we're starting to focus on, both in our own facilities as well as with our customers. Um, and then I know another big focus that will have to happen is around the degraded lands. Farmlands, wetlands, forest. There's a tremendous amount of degraded land that used to be very productive out there. Um, and if we're not going to cut down every single national forest in every single area where we have any sort of wild habitat in order to grow food, we're going to need to bring back online some of those lands that are degraded today. So that's just our how we see climate change. Now I'm going to show a little bit more outside of Sodexo again, but what is the food sector overall? Food and beverage companies, the industry, what are the trends? Um, and thinking perhaps about how the government, how NASA could play into that would be great. Though I will say just up front, when I was thinking about, so what could NASA do? How could they play? I was really hoping you would tell me that you discovered another planet where we could grow food. <laughs> because we're just about out of space on this one. <laughs> Excellent. We've got plenty of planets, but the growing food parts. 
Yeah, that's the tricky part I hear. And, and the bringing it back efficiently, I think, might be troublesome. Um, but um, so, so what are some of the things that are happening right now in the food sector? What are the conversations? Where is the innovation? Um, one is the intersection of this local community, small holder, and sustainability discussion. Um, and these are my one-year-old one twins um, and my parents' cute little farm. And they have a cute little farm because local agriculture is booming. If you go to the grocery store, what's the number one thing that you will see that you think, oh, good for the planet? Local. If your college student comes home and says, oh, we have to, something around food, local, buy local. Um, so that is tremendously catchy. Um, and what's the number two thing? Some certification. If it's fair trade or if it's organic, that would be probably the number two thing that our consumers latch on to. But local is, is definitely the first. And local overall has very few climate benefits. Some places it might benefit the climate, some places it might not. Generally, local production is going to be small production, which is going to be less efficient. So they're going to have more inputs with fewer outputs. Um, sometimes they may deliver the food in an old diesel truck with one box in the back. Um, sometimes it might be wonderfully efficient and it might be right around the corner and they might do a fantastic job on their farm. But across the board, there's not really sort of six of one, half dozen of the other. It's not the answer. Um, but it's extremely catchy. Is there a way to get that catchy, easy answer onto something that also has those climactic benefits? That's a huge question in our mind. And as scientists, I really challenge you to think about how are you talking to the populace? I know you don't deal with this particular issue, but how this is an area where the sustainability com community and the scientists who do life cycle assessments of how much carbon comes out of the field and the transportation and the food production are not very good at talking to, to consumers who are buying the food and making those choices and say local. I can understand local. I like local. Let's buy local. And there's nothing wrong with local. Local is a wonderful benefit to the community. And that's the other trend is those same scientists who have always said, oh, well, the answer is this whole different kind of fertilization system and let's feed the cows flaxseed so they don't fart as much are now starting to try to say, well, it's true. Um, is there a way to talk about this holistically, ways that benefit the local community and the climate? And then maybe if you're going way out on that field and human health, can you put those three together and have benefits for all three? Um, and I think that's an emerging trend that we're trying to figure out both in this country and globally, because there is a lot of food that comes from the tropics. There was a college the other day in Minnesota that really wanted local coffee. And I tried to walk them through the local coffee question. And their question was they wanted to benefit the local economy. And there was a coffee roaster around the corner that could roast coffee locally and then have that employment opportunity local. That's what they were looking for. But when the words local coffee came out, I had to pause. So, but, and so then we also got to get into the conversation of well, where, what about those communities where the coffee is grown? What, what do you care about in those communities as well? And so tying our local communities where we eat, I would say, in the Western world with communities that are growing so much of this food and that caring for these communities to those other communities, mixing that together, I think, is one of those trends that's coming. Another one, very different is about tools, catchy tools. Um, and this gets to that, what's the second most common thing you see in a grocery store? It's about the certifications. Um, and certifications are often about practice standards. So it is, do you do no-till agriculture? Do you use these pesticides? And increasingly, there's a movement towards trying to get to performance. So rather than do you use these pesticides, it's how much methane is produced on the field. And here are the different pesticide options that can help you to figure out how to reduce that. But it's about the actual production of carbon or production of methane or production of any of those gases that some of these new tools are focusing on. So you'll put in the practices you'll do, you're doing, or in the case of the cool farm tool, these are just two examples, or in field to market, 
this is kind of interesting, they get satellite data that tells them some of the characteristics of the field and some of the things that might then be useful to do on that field as a result of whatever topographic or things that they can see from that satellite. And I don't know the details, which you guys probably know very well. Um, but these are sort of, this is the next cutting edge, is how do we move agriculture from what they sort of got started to get used to, which is these practices, doing no-till, towards saying, well, what I really want is just to increase the soil carbon. How do I do that? It might be no-till over here, it might be something else over here, but it's the actual goal that they're focused on that is starting to shift. The next trend is NGOs. Um, when, when many folks here were kids, I would say that the, the model of NGOs interacting with the private sector was the Greenpeace model of attack and protest and get changes to happen. Um, and it's increasingly working with companies, and I would say that it's been tremendously effective. Some of these public-private partnerships, uh, we're partners with the World Wildlife Fund ourselves, um, have been very, very useful. Rather than that adversarial, well, I guess if you really make me, I'll make this one little shift. It's looking at our system, looking at all of our points of impact, and figuring out where we can make really positive changes um, that are within, for us, the mission of World Wildlife Fund, and within our business interests as well. And we would never have thought that way 30 years ago. Um, so this is certainly an exciting trend in my mind. Um, and a lot of the leading companies that are trying to think about sustainability are engaging with these and other NGOs um, to really focus on how do we collaborate, how do we work together. The NGOs are starting to get a lot more savvy um, about how to work with businesses. And then sort of similar to that, but then at a larger scale, and where I think government comes in, is some of these multi-stakeholder efforts. Um, a couple of these are sort of global roundtables. Bon Sucro is the sugar round, global sugar roundtable focused on sugarcane production, and that's uh, Portuguese. Um, sustainable palm oil roundtable, global roundtable on sustainable beef. These are, and then some of these others are other efforts to bring together companies, NGOs, farmers, trade groups, and they've often tried to get government involved with varying degrees of success, but usually pretty limited, um, to talk about how do we consolidate standards? How do we talk to certifications? Where are we going with the entire sugarcane industry? Because if just a couple of the big players make the commitments, you might still have 40% of the production that's really terrible. How can you bring up the entire sugar industry? For beef, those solutions are hard. Can you find a pre-competitive space for all of these companies? Can you find a space where the NGOs can talk to the science, where the trade groups can talk to the realities of the field and find solutions together? This is, I think, the most exciting trend. Um, it's hard, it takes some time, because those players aren't used to working together and you need to form the ground rules of how to work together. Um, but it's really good work that's happening in these. Um, and I would say that there's certainly scope for government involvement. Um, there's been a little bit of government involvement in different ones of these, usually around the, in the EU, um, more so. Um, but it would be interesting to see in the food and agriculture space any of the government agencies that are traditionally focused on setting the organic standard, for example, engage in how do we take all the standards and find perhaps those performance metrics and incentivize that and move forward. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Um, I really wanted to make sure we got some time for questions. Yeah, the question was about um, GMOs and where does Sodexo lie on the GMO question, given that we 
um, do provide food services in a lot of countries, some of which have regulated against GMOs, some of which are very pro, some of which are middle of the road. Yes, that's me to repeat. Um, Sodexo really follows the law in all the countries that we operate in. So within the European Union, we provide food free of GMOs um, in all the ways that meet their, their legislation requirements. Um, in, this, in the US, we meet all of our regulations here which say that GMOs are safe. And so we do use foods that have GMOs here. Um, I would say on this topic that it's one of those areas that scientists have not done a very good job of figuring out how to talk to the public and where GMOs did the most amazing job I have ever, NGOs did the most amazing job I've ever seen of swaying public opinion in Europe. Um, if there's any, ever a topic that NGOs were extremely good at dealing with and changing the entire public opinion and then getting legislation, it was GMOs. Um, I think there's a lot of scientific consensus, similar to the amount of consensus around climate change, actually, that GMOs are, are generally safe for human health and for the environment. you made a categorical statement that uh, the 2% reduction in wheat uh, yield was a result of climate change that's already occurred. And uh, it didn't count that in terms of any uncertainty in the number. Also, um, well, my question is a little uh, broader than that. You have projections that the climate is going to change by a certain amount, by a certain time. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of uncertainty in those projections. And I'm interested in knowing how Sodexo uh, deals with that uncertainty. Yes. Um, how do, so there's a lot of uncertainty in projections, and I put up some actual numbers, and how does Sodexo deal with the uncertainty as well as the predictions to make our policies and move forward? Um, it's a really good question, and I would say we try to take the available science, a lot of this is from the IPCC report, and which is the premier international body that puts out reports on climate change, probably you know that. Um, and we think a lot about switching. We're in the, the very lucky position. Um, we're not really a branded company. We're not your Coca-Cola that will absolutely continue to rely on sugarcane. We're not your McDonald's that will absolutely continue to rely on beef we can make a lot of decisions to shift between products. Um, right now we're making a conscious decision to try to shift towards plant-based diets, for example. Um, so some of the ways that Sodexo can certainly deal with this is by shifting to crops that are not experiencing this kind of climactic disruption. Um, and in terms of looking towards the future and projecting, all we can do is take the best available science. And it's one of the reasons that we do value the NGO collaboration. WWF is very helpful in trying to bring us the latest in the science because we don't, frankly, hire a lot of scientists in Sodexo. Um, so that's where we need our NGO engagement, and we rely on some of those multi-stakeholder groups. Did that answer? You look well, like you have a follow-on. I, I guess I'm interested in something a little more detailed than, you know, we just, we just try to rely on the science because it goes those projections that are, that they are, you know, you have a wide range of possible futures in front mm -hmm. of you, and some of those few possible futures, your business model may not work, and others it might work, you know, so in some ways I think you're going to have to hedge your bets somehow, and I'm interested in knowing what the process is of Sodexo for doing that hedging, or whether you just say, okay, this is the average predicted change, we're just going to shoot for that and hope that, uh, that, that it will still be around and, uh, you know, profitable in the future. Um, I'd say it's a mixture. I'd say we're betting on sustainability. Um, it's why we've invested in having a, a team and why we're looking at how we purchase food, how we're looking at how we manage buildings to have an impact on that climate so that we can try to shoot for a lower scenario, given our size and our impact on the issue. Um, because we'd really like to avoid the, the worst catastrophic futures. Um, I'd say it's why we're investing in things like energy management. We have a huge team that started up in the last five years that's doing a lot of services around um, some of the more innovative low climate, low carbon solutions around buildings. 
Um, if you have a solution, we'd certainly be interested in listening on how, how do you figure out how to make the business model work in every different future. But I think it's also new for businesses to be thinking on this time scale. Um, to, any, to think about what is the world going to look like in 2030 and 2050 is, is not something that's common for businesses. Um, so even looking at that far, I would say we're generally ahead of most of our competitors. Um, Hello. For future questions, please do come to the mic so that the recording can be seen. Um, but just to follow up to that same kind of that same question, um, given given the impact and, and kind of uh, scope and scale of your company, um, how much could you or should you try to affect sustainability? Right now, it sounds like you can, you're trying to be nimble. And you're so big that you can adapt and maybe you can pass on um, near-term costs to the customers in exchange for figuring out longer-term solutions that are lower cost, for instance. But is there a way for you to suggest lower impact diets or some of these things? I'd say absolutely, and it's certainly top of our mind. When we're thinking about our impact, we're not thinking particularly this quarter. We're thinking about how do we change people's diets like we did on salt? How do we change that around low, lower protein diets, for, or lower um, animal-based protein diets, for example? Um, but there's a variety of other areas where we're trying to think about how can we reformulate the way that purchasing is done? How can we incentivize our suppliers to start even tracking any of these metrics um, to understand how can we make proactive purchases? A lot of this information doesn't exist today. I just had a question about another one of the climate impacts, which is the increase in extreme weather events. Um, so I know that you said you don't own the property, so you don't have those infrastructure issues, perhaps, but you are resident in them. And so I just am curious how the company is handling those kinds of issues. Um, it's a good question, and I will um, I will say that this was what actually first attracted me to Sodexo, was after I had read, when I was reading and applying to the job, I read a lot of the media stories, and there are a lot of places that are affected by these extreme events increasingly, and Sodexo is in all of them, <laughs> because we're everywhere. Um, and so, I've seen Sodexo teams pull together and provide local communities with emergency food shelters, emergency beds, everywhere. It's, it's really amazing to see the Sodexo team pull together and help people out in those extreme events. Um, so I would say it absolutely affects our people and our people are uniquely positioned to actually help in those particular extreme events. It's not our business model. but. Um, we have a, a very serious philanthropic culture around volunteering in the stop hunger arena, and I think that that has translated very strongly into, um, or perhaps even grew out of, um, how we help people in all the communities where we work, because we are inherently, we hire locally everywhere that we are, so all of our people are embedded in our communities. Um, I'm curious about um, the leftovers um, portion that you talked mm -hmm. about earlier. I mean, when I go to some events or even when I go to a grocery store, I see so much food. And uh, I've gone to events that there's a, uh, food provided and I've asked servers what happens with the leftovers because I'm concerned about, you know, uh, providing. Um, and they usually say, we just throw it out. You know, there's no mechanisms or requirements uh, that I know of, of handling that, the leftover food. Yeah. I mean, is there anything that Sodexo is doing or somebody's doing on requirements or policies to deal with, with, um, with that issue? Absolutely, and I would say we very closely follow the EPA food waste recovery hierarchy. <laughs> Which, and for us that translates into, first of all, being really careful about portion control. What are we putting out? Do you even need to put out that much food? Do you need to cook that much rice? Um, and working with our folks in the back of the house. I have seen our teams picture a cafeteria in the background, get competitive about which station wastes the least at any, any given meal just from the preparation and from the putting out the right amount. It's, it's amazing to see our teams get really excited about this and it become an issue in the back of the house. 
Um, so that's the first, is just reducing the waste that happens in the first place. And then in terms of what do you do with the waste that may still inevitably exist, um, there is a whole hierarchy that we follow in how to deal with it, and landfill is the absolute last. And compost is the second to last. Um, we really try for human consumption, animal consumption, energy production before. And there are a lot of regulations about what can happen to food if it's going to be provided to other people. For example, we do a lot of donation to food banks, homeless shelters, et cetera, but there's a lot of regulation. If it's basically, if it's gone out to you as a customer, it can no longer go to any other people. Um, it's done. And so then you have to look down to animal energy compost landfill, <laughs> last of all. Um, but there are, so, and that's one of the areas, there's a, an interesting group, um, GMA, Grocery Manufacturers Association, started up Food Waste Recovery Alliance um, with some others, bringing some food banks together with some big companies, together with some of the regulations, together with the EPA to try to say, are the regulations the right ones around people donation? Are there some economies of scale between, say, food service and grocery stores? They together perhaps provide the right things for, say, those pig farms that really need it for their their biodigesters. Um, so that's one of those instances very concretely where that alliance is looking at ways to make policy work, ways to make concrete projects on the ground work, um, to not send so much to the landfill. But reduction is always first. Um, you, you asked if we had another planet. And, and or two, of, at the rate we're going. Well, we sort of do. Um, in the 1950s, the science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke, wrote a book called Deep Range, in which he speculated, um, you know, this was fiction, of course, that the world's population would reach 6 billion, and uh, that we would be forced by shortages of food to turn vegetarian and start farming kelp in the oceans, the way we have turned all the land into, uh, you know, turn grasslands and prairies into uh, farm fields. So do you think that there is a approach or a future where we turn more to growing things in the ocean uh, and changing our eating habits in order to adapt to that food source? I hope so. It's very hard to change consumption patterns. It's extremely hard um, in an overt way. The covert taking potassium out of your potato chips or salt or whatever is, is easier, but to actually get people to switch to um, more kelp or um, things like that is tough. Even switching between fish species to an underutilized fish species that might be abundant is um, it's a challenge and it takes a lot of education. Um, it's where I'm really hopeful that Sodexo can have some interesting impacts since we touch people at the beginning of their life all the way through it. So if we can start some of that education in our elementary schools, in our high schools, in our colleges, and these students with information being so available today they are tuned into everything. You put a label on a fi piece of fish, and 10 minutes later, there'll be 20 kids who know exactly what it means, and they're asking what fishery it was from that was MSC certified. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. So I'm hopeful that that level of engagement and interest and information will help that shift. But it's very hard. I will say there's some interesting examples that we do around behavioral economics. If you, for example, put the chocolate milk behind the regular milk, kids will drink the regular milk two-thirds of the time. If you switch it, they'll drink the chocolate milk three-quarters of the time. Um, if you put the cake station behind the salad bar, they'll eat more salad. Um, very simple things that do make a big difference. Um, so, and if you change those consumption patterns early, does it stick? Hopefully. Um, those are some of the things that we're doing to try to get there. But in terms of the ocean, um, I would say aquaculture is one of those interesting examples, which sometimes that's aquaculture in the ocean, sometimes it's on land. But aquaculture is skyrocketing compared to just wild fisheries. And some of it's being done extremely well. There's a lot of eyes on aquaculture. There's a lot of efforts trying to improve it, trying to have standards and regulations and certifications around aquaculture. and. I think there's a lot of hope for increasing the fish-based part of people's diets and having aquaculture supply a lot of that. Thank you. So, uh, you mentioned um, food switching a couple of times, and I was wondering 
Um, you also say that you, you do a lot of uh, elder care type facilities. And I can't picture my dad switching away from the state for anything short of a gun or a knife. Uh, and that's only if it's bigger than the one he happens to have at the time. So my question for you is, is what are some of the kind of things that you're, you're looking at? You mentioned a couple of things. Are, are you looking at things like instead of making an all beef hot dog, putting some soy in there? Or are you looking at things like instead of having a steak, you have a taco? I would say it completely runs the gamut. It's everything, for, and it, it's interesting, country by country, different things work. In France, surprisingly, it works quite well to switch from a steak to a steamed spinach, for example. You don't even need to replace the protein with a protein. Um, and culturally... It will not be in France. <laughs> <laughs> um, and part of it is in the framing. How do you work with your customers? And, and there it's about being part of an entire balanced week worth of meals. It's saying that in your average week you eat more meat than you need. And so at this meal you don't you don't need to replace a protein with a protein. You really just need to increase your vegetable consumption. Um, in Texas that doesn't work as well. <laughs> and so it really varies wherever we go and our local operators do, our managers of any given site do certainly adapt our centralized um, promotions to fit the culture of their place. So in some places it might be adding soy into a hamburger or working with our suppliers to do more of that stealth switching as opposed to the overt getting people to switch their actual choices and their behaviors. Um, senior centers are tough. The health, in, in a lot of cases health is one of the first things that we think about and to do some switches on and it it shows us how it's going to work in sustainability, and sometimes there's a benefit to both, like switching away from meat, where you benefit both the climate and your health. But it's hard. If you figure out how to get your father to switch, let us know. Yeah, I was in my local grocery store and I saw uh, kale chips. So maybe there'll be uh, kelp chips next. But. So my question is on policy related, and if you're able to answer this, please, um, is what what the corporation is doing, your corporation is doing, or can do on the policy side on the hill, if there if there are communications there uh, from the corporate side to basically break the break the log jam. I would say we're not particularly involved in the political scene in the U.S. We're French based, and we don't do any lobbying in the U.S. actually wanted to pick up on the common policy the, the same way it was actually the international dimension of that question, so thanks for setting it up. Uh, what countries are, are you active in advocating in, and, and, um, and what are you seeing as potentially an international trend towards um, particular policies, whether it's cap and trade, whether it's carbon taxes, carbon credits, and others? Uh, and so, uh, yes, with one question is, which countries are you actively advocating in? Uh, and the second part of that is which policies is your country advocating in which, and I guess third, which countries do you think are, are sort of leading? Sure. I'd say um, in Europe we're really very involved with government in a variety of different ways and talking with, with some of those players. Um, France is, as our headquarters, is where we're probably the most active in terms of engaging with the, with the government actors and understanding that. But I would also say that we are increasingly savvy about climate and we're increasingly knowing that we need to be and so we're trying to understand all the different country legislations and how those play and how we can be a part of the proactive solution. I'd say it's why energy management has skyrocketed as part of our business in the last 10 years because we recognize cap and trade. There's, I mean, there's so many different iterations in different countries and different continents but regulation of various sorts is almost certainly coming almost everywhere at some point, and can we be ahead of it, and can we already be thinking about the solutions that are going to be needed before those regulations come into place? Hi, um, when I think about sustainability and the health of the planet, for me, um, human population, you know, inevitably enters into that. You know, that's a difficult calculation to make. I'm just wondering whether it's the XO or any of the other that you've talked about today are talking about that, either with governments or amongst yourselves? Population is absolutely the biggest part of this. Um, it's why we need more than one planet right now. Um, 
I would say we're not engaged in any sort of population discussions, but what we're thinking about is where that population is coming on board also. Um, it's, it's not the places where we've traditionally done most of our business in the Western world. It's increasingly in other places in the developing world, which, as you could see from some of these, is going to be the part of the world hit most, most difficultly by all of these different things around agriculture and the climate. And that's where you're going to have more people. So all those impacts on smallholders are only going to be compounded. Um, that's When we're thinking about population increase, that's what we're thinking about. But not work uh, dealing with policies that might affect the population growth or No. I have a question that's just fairly general. As I was listening to your presentation, and it's very clear that you all have worked very well with the NGOs and a lot of the uh, making uh, us aware of the impact of climate change. But what do you really feel? here in the United States the governments can do, and specifically NASA? What do you feel for me to do? It's a good question. I don't have a very good sense of how NASA has engaged with the private sector in the past um, around the climate issue, but I think one of the areas that I would love to see take off in that is with, that, with respect to that is around these tools that are trying to bring satellite data into understanding what is the climate of a farm and what are the different interventions that are needed. I grew up on a little dairy farm where I can tell you that the fields that were flat, that were down in the lowlands, needed very different than the ones on a hillside, and that was just a tiny farm. Um, so some of these tools that are trying to understand that, that are trying to provide farmers with really easy, and let me stress easy, um, tools that just help them make those decisions um, has to be the future. And right now there's really no, this field to market effort has thought about the international application and some of that data just doesn't exist to their knowledge. In the US there's some better data and I think they're looking to improve and continue to move forward with trying to figure out how to integrate actual satellite data, which I assume is y'all's purview, um, into these tools and how that can give them good information. Um, that's so all of these tools are an area where I think there could be some really interesting collaboration. Can you get from just pictures of the field and what that tells you to anything about emissions and parts of the country and transportation and movements? I, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, thank Thanks, you all uh, for having me very much. Let's thank Margaret for her uh, wonderful discussion. As a token of our appreciation, we're going to provide uh, Margaret with our award-winning book, Earth is Art, so Excellent. she can remember the Earth and NASA. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Look forward to your the talk next month.